Abby, thank you so much for joining me for an Audible Sessions interview about your brand new book, This Is Not A Pity Memoir. Thank you very much for having me. Um, can you start by just um, introducing it and, and what you sort of cover in the book? Okay, so This Is Not A Pity Memoir opens in June 2018 um, when my partner Jacob, um, at the time, um, collapsed with a brain seizure and um, so ensued a sort of kind of chaotic complete kind of vault fast upturning of our life and really the book captures the next two years as he goes into um, intensive care and then into a coma for six to seven months and then um, coming out of that coma his rehab and recovery um, and then bringing him home and it's really about it's about love actually I never intended to I, I wasn't setting out to write a love story I think I had quite a hate story going on a lot of the time when I was writing it but what I didn't realize was it was a love story and it's really it's a love story um absolutely about Jacob but it's also mm. about the, the the family and my children and our wider family both mine and Jacob's and the way we pull together and the way we've we've had to reconfigure and get to know Jacob again because at the heart of it um, when Jacob woke up after um, I say six to seven months because he was going in and out for that last month but when he actually finally woke up he developed a delusion called Capgra delusion which is um, the delusion that the person close to you is an imposter. And so for a year, he didn't believe that I was Abby Morgan, his partner or wife. And has your idea of love changed since that moment that Jacob, yeah. you know, had that fit, went into that, that mm. coma? Mm. Do you see love as something different now than you did then? Someone recently sent me a really interesting article about the seven kinds of love. I think it's from a Greek pers perspective, and that was kind of from Eros to Philia to... Storge, which are all these different kinds of love. And I suddenly realised, of course, we have different kinds of love. We have, obviously, the desire, sexual desire for someone, the passion, and then we have the kind of com companionship and friendship of a, of a marriage or a, a close friendship. And then we have the kind of, I think it's called Storge, which is the love unsymmetrical love of a parent you know you adore your child they probably find you a pain in the arse but you love them and and so I think it's widened my capacity and the different kinds of love I now recognize and experience because I think if you go through any kind of testing time with someone who you're very close to the nature of that love has to shift and change because uh, mm. the dynamic of your relationship changes so I think it's really widened my understanding of love. I describe it as this weird hum of love and it sounds a bit whimsical and kind of like some kind of Santa Fe platitude, but I can only describe it like that, which is I just realized that love is a kind of hum. It just vibrated through me even when I couldn't reach Jacob. I just felt this incredible hum, not only coming from me, but from this kind of community of people who we built around him, mm. um, who all helped to bring him back. And so, yeah, that's that's what I sort of see it as. And from that moment when he was in um, a coma in hospital, mm. when you look back at that time, how do you... Are there memories that are particular that come to mind or mm. are there regrets? Gosh, that's a good question. I mean, definitely in terms of memories, I think it's a, it was a very vivid time. It was very adrenalised. I mean, I, my fundamental feeling about the book is I feel like, uh, you know, if you've ever got horribly drunk... And, you know, just let out every secret of your life. And the next day you wake up going, what the hell did I say? I have that feeling about it. And yet the transparency and the nature of that experience and exposing that experience, I kind of knew um, was fascinating to me and I hope would be fascinating to someone else. And so when I look back at that time, I see it through the prism, um, certainly in those early months, certainly in the sort of six, seven months when Jake was in a coma. Um, it's so adrenalised, that experience, and yet there's a monotony to it. And so you have moments of intense action. So, you know, heartbreaking moments where you have to take your children, you know, their father might not survive the night. And then the kind of recovery from that, and then you have the kind of weeks where you're just going in every day and you're, you know, making sure he's having his hair cut and his nails are being cut and he's being talked to and he's being loved and he's being communicated with, even though you're not getting anything back. Um, so I suppose my memory about it is that there's this very strange ebb and flow with the intensive care and I couldn't get over the kind of tenderness and love of the nurses actually and the way they would just let you go and they go, it's okay, we've got him. And so that was an incredible feeling to watch this amazing community of nurses. I know people use platitudes and you know we've all realised what heroes the NHS is now. But when you are absolutely at that kind of um, life and death end of the NHS, there is not, I don't think there's a better 
place in the world to be actually because they were just absolutely extraordinary and so when when he came round mm. and he didn't recognize mm. you for you mm. he thought you were an imposter how did that feel I mean, at first it was really, I couldn't, I was so, I was in such, dis, I mean, it slightly makes me laugh now. I was in such disbelief. If I, you know, I'm, I mean, I should preface all this by saying I'm a screenwriter. So my job is to deal with dramatic tropes and cliche. And I thought, this is such a dramatic cliche. It can't really be happening. And I'd actually joked about it. You know, I'd, a friend had said, you know, what would, you know, what, what, what would happen if you, if he doesn't wake up and remember you? And I went, of course he's going to remember me. You know, I'd, it didn't even cross my mind. It was not even a fear. Um, so I think when he did um, wake up, and it was a sort of slow gathering, I think it took a couple of weeks for me to fully, you know, have it confirmed that absolutely he didn't know who I was. I I mean, the, I talk about it in the book, but I kept on asking people if they could feel the underground. And I remember walking down the stairs one day and just having to grip the wall thinking, what is wrong with me? And I realised I was shaking. I had this incredible internal shake. And so when people say your world is rocked, um, I would say my world was rocked. I think what I tried to do was I, I, I have these two, you know, you know, you've, you've put all these work into these children, you know, you've tried to give them the best and you've tried to, you know, navigate them through the worst. And I just felt like, OK, I can be shaking, but I need to keep them steady. Or, I mean, the irony was I think they kept me steady. <laughs> I think it was not. The, so um, I guess it was it was really shocking. And then there was a sort of it went through different phases. You know, it went it, beca- it, it was funny. Then it was tiresome. Then it was deeply painful. Then it was terrifying because when I realised we, you know, I think initially when I started to talk to people, there was real concern that if he still had it post three months, then it wasn't going to go. Mm. And three months came and he still was absolutely adamant I wasn't Abby Morgan. Um, I was someone else. And so I think, you know, he, he was the one who came up with the notion that I must be being employed by the state to help look after him and the children. And so that became the kind of through line that we we played with and then we became friends and that's really the way I describe it you know and then it became I, I kind of dicked around with him I'd do anything to get his attention because the thing that was shocking to me was the loss of attention you know it was the arrival of a friend and you'd say thanks very much could you leave the room please I'd like to be with my friends or you know or the or, or a family member saying I need to be with my family now could you go and it was very perverse to suddenly be on the outside of my life looking in I guess so um and so I just fought to get back in I, that's where I'd describe it. So I would do silly things, you know. Um, I knew food was his great love, so I, any any opportunity. I mean, I ended up horribly overfeeding it. Him, it maybe added. So we had to reverse that over months. But um, you know, we, you know, I'd take him up for cake. I'd, I, I, you know, I'd wheel past. But you know, one of the things I used to do is I used to grab a wheelchair and wheel past. And one day I went in and just gave him a carrot and left him, and he just didn't know what I was doing. And so I'd do anything to slightly annoy him. He'd he'd go to he'd go to go to the bathroom and I'd lie in his bed, in the hospital room and he'd come back and go why are you doing that and I kept on really and I was trying to stir up I was trying to stir up that part of him that that was annoyed by me and I thought well if I can get him annoyed again if I can piss him off again in the way that I used to <laughs> yeah. maybe he'll it'll ricochet back you know mm. maybe it'll, it'll make sense. So you got to the point as you describe it mm. as a, a friendship. Yeah. Is there a, like a, a time you can pinpoint where mm. he started to accept you and mm. did he decide eventually that, that you're Abby? I think one of the things that was really shocking when Jacob first worked, you know, he had to learn how to... He didn't have to learn how to talk again. He could talk, but what he had to learn was... He had to learn how to walk again. He had to learn how to physically move, but he also had to learn how to initiate. Um, and he had absolutely no agency or initiation for, uh, I would say, you know, a good couple of years. Actually, it's taken a long time. And so he was very silent. But I noticed that I could start to puncture him with humour. And he started, I noticed one day he was looking out for me. I could see he was looking out for me and he didn't see me. But he asked the nurse, is she here yet? And I thought, oh, OK, something's changing here. So, um, so there were little changes and that was just towards the end of rehab and he was coming home during that summer. So, but again, it would ebb and flow and it went backwards and forwards and then... My ch- where I really noticed it was um, when Jacob first came home, he had a lot of sort of hallucinations, sort of wake- wakeful hallucinations where he talked to people and he'd claw the air and or he'd drive or he'd drink or he'd... And you knew that that, that was probably a low-level seizuring. And I could hear him also doing that at night. And what was extraordinary at night, he'd be silent all day, but at night I could hear he was talking to me. So he used to call me babe. 
And I used to hear him saying, yeah, babe, I'll just get the keys. Yeah, babe, wait a minute, let's do it later. And then one day, I think when my children, it was my daughter's 16th birthday and my son's 18th birthday. And we had a party in the January. So it was a year, exactly a year. And, um, you know, and I do, you know, I talk about it in the book, but, you know, if I run out of ideas, I have a party <laughs> or I cook a dinner <laughs> because it's very exhausting being with a silent person. And mm. so... Um, I, we had this ridiculous party. It was pouring with rain. I was realizing it was an absolute disaster. Why did I do it? I invited lots of people to this very uptight restaurant. Um, and I asked them all. I remember like, we had a song, um, which is Jack Johnson's Better Together. And I had this idea that we were gonna, everyone was going to sing it to the kids at the end, not realizing that the only people who know that song are me and my children <laughs> and my friend who played the piano. So he sort of sang along and remembered it. And that's the funny thing. He's been brilliant on lyrics. He loves music. Mm. Um, but I just remember we were sitting watching when the kids were blowing out their candles and he just he just slipped his hand in mine and squeezed it and went, well done, babe. And I looked at him and I realised he was starting to segue, I think, the feeling for Abby Morgan to Abby because mm. he, he ended up calling me Abby and he called her Abby Morgan. Right. And then it just gradually came out, sort of evolved over that and then one day he was looking at a photo on a photo popped up on an iPad I talk about it and I said I sort of did lots of stupid gags and he just kind of looked blanked and blank and a bit embarrassed for me really that I was just trying to get him to realize that the photo was him and me you know we were hugging each other and as I turned my back he went yes I'm I'm starting to think there might be similarities and then it just evolved really um but Jake's neuropsychiatrist said something interesting and I talk about it in the book which he said I don't think the cap girl will ever go. It'll just become less useful to him. And I think there's a truth in that. You know, I think Jacob absolutely has reconnected and adores me. And that's why I think I question him because I used to piss him off a lot more. But, um, but I do think, you know, I think he started to realise that it was okay to start to inhabit this life. You know, he had a shattering experience. You know, he seizured for six months mm. and he was, I I use a lot of metaphor in the book. I talk about, you know, him being in a spaceship or deep underwater or through the woods. I was constantly trying to find where Jake was because I know he went somewhere and I still don't know quite where he went. You know, you know what I should add is, is in the last six months, Jacob has made the most extraordinary recovery that none of us, none of us expected would happen. You know, we'd given, I'd given up. Um, certainly this time last year I'd sort of accepted that this was as good as it was going to get and in the last six to eight months Jake's just gone off the chart so um, I'm sort of very committed to continuing that and ensuring that he gets the adventures and we get the adventures again in our life together yeah. I suppose well thank you so much Abby it's uh, been such a pleasure to talk to you so nice thank you